these hypotheses, fundamentally that the Earth has been influenced by electrical discharge. It's not the only thing it's been influenced by. But how can we quantify that? So with that background, I'll have to talk about the geological effects of running water. It's an important component of our past, and it still is measured today. Electric discharges on dielectric media is something we can do in the lab. And as you've seen in the past few talks, electric discharges are scalable. It's a fundamental aspect of these studies, is that what we do in the lab, if we have a source for it at the galactic scale or at the Earth scale, it can occur and we can measure it. You can't do that with water. That's the, the only drawback to water. You can only scale it a few orders of magnitude in the laboratory. And the fractal analysis is a tool with which we'll use to, uh, to measure these items. So I'll take you through how I measured some of these landforms and compared them to existing electric discharges. So really, what is water? Water flows all over the Earth. You can find many pictures of it. We know we can measure it. We can measure what it actually does on the Earth. Electrical discharges, however, are a little bit different. They have uh, fractal patterns. They're somewhat chaotic, but also uh, ordered in their discharge patterns. I'll show a few other pictures from uh, Captured Lightning. They do a lot of great work with these Lichtenberg patterns in polyacrylic type resins, and you get these beautiful dendritic patterns. So we can actually measure these, these items in the lab, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So let's be honest. How many of you flew here, right? You look over the Earth, you see some pretty perplexing landscapes. And now we can view that on our laptops, and we can measure things on our laptops, OK? And, and myself, as a chemist, I'm a chemist. I'm not a geologist, but I understand the concepts behind some geology. I was wondering if the current geological paradigm was missing something. As I flew over the Earth and I saw these tremendous dendritic patterns and cratering and mountaintops right next to floodplains and other different topological features. So I, I was wondering, OK, we can talk all we want about other mechanisms. But if we don't have a quantitative way to measure that, no one will hear us. So is there a quantitative relationship to the various topological aspects of the Earth. And I believe there is, and that's what fractal analysis will tell us. I'm from New Jersey, northern New Jersey. It is more than Newark Airport. There are some beautiful regions in New Jersey. Uh, where I live, there are a lot of granite outcrops, a lot of um, very strange hogbacks that run from the north to the west, or north, northwest. Beautiful lake region. So that's about 10 square miles there on Google terrain. As we back out an order of magnitude, we see some interesting aspects to, uh, to the topology. We see our Appalachian Mountains here that run, uh, folded patterns. Supposedly, these are uh, ancient mountains that have been eroded away. But right up butted against them are dendritic patterns in cavern, uh, uh, extensive can canyons in central Pennsylvania, formed by water, presumably. This butts up against the coast, which has been um, thought to be a floodplain. And there's beautiful Newark down there. If you back out more on the East Coast, uh, it, it then comes up to the floodplains of the Mississippi region. Ozarks are down here. New Hampshire, the granite state. Granite outcrops everywhere. Fairly high mountains up there. But again, the Appalachians stretch down uh, throughout Virginia. And you have your Chesapeake Bay there. So in terms of scaling, when we back out from our small 10 square mile aspect, we see some very unique features uh, at different scales. We've already seen in the past number of presentations, there haven't been that many already, that we, we can assume, at least for the hypothesis, that the Earth was bathed in equilibration of electrical energy. From sun, from the galaxy, from other bodies, we don't know. That was the past. That is an origins question. That is a different conversation. But what we can do is we can measure what's left over, and we can see if we can draw any conclusions from that. So in that sense, uh, this is a slide borrowed from, from Wall. Uh, if the current is coming in in our galaxy, we are just a very small subset of this. Again, it goes back to scale. Michael Claridge showed that so well. It goes back to scale. We are just a very, very small speck of dust on one of these arms. And if there is electric current flowing through these arms, it is reasonable to assume that we've been influenced by that in the past. Again, from Wall's presentation, this is just a local hypothesized environment of the plasma solar system and where our incoming charge is coming from, from our plasma pinch currents. Again, look at the scale. The sun is still but a small speck 
on this overall space of things. And then from a size scale, from a NASA view, our little blue dot of Earth here, we are very small compared to the sun. So it's reasonable to expect that large changes in the sun's output could influence us dramatically now that we know we're tied electrically to it. We know that in recent years, 1850s, late 1850s, a tremendous corona affected telegraph lines, blew out many of them. If such a corona would happen these days, uh, we'd be in loads of trouble. But we also have to realize that electrical effects are not the only effect. Many years of very hard work by very smart people have established certain aspects of fluvial erosion, erosion by glaciers. It does occur. We can't deny that. But on what scale? What is the order of magnitude of a fluvial erosion versus a, a massive electric thunderbolt brought about by discharge across the Earth's atmosphere? So these discharges do exhibit, dia, uh, discharges across dielectrics do exhibit fractal type patterns. And what is a fractal? Many of you might be familiar with the Mandelbrot set. It's a very fun uh, whirlwind through YouTube if you zoom in, and it goes and repeats to infinity no matter where you increase your magnification on this set. That's a fractal. It is the same as it is near as it is from far. So discharges across dielectrics, a dielectric being some sort of insulator, exhibit these kind of fractal characteristics. So again, the uh, captured lightning folks do this marvelously. Um, this is a discharge across polycarbonate. And as if you zoom in to infinity, you could theorize down to the single electron path in these dendritic patterns. Now, interestingly enough, when, when fractal analysis started coming about, Mandelbrot pioneered this in the sev uh, early 70s and 80s, published a book. Fra fractal shorelines and shorelines were the first to be analyzed. Uh, they did exhibit, exhibit some sort of fractal characteristics. In this case, it's Chesapeake Bay. Uh, we see our, our dendritic pattern here. And also some could be brought about by uh, flow of the rivers from rainfall, from constant season changes. But what are the main effects? How much of an effect does the fluvial erosion of a riverbed have versus an electrical origin? Can we quantify that? So that's what we'll explore. If you go walking down the street or in a, um, on a muddy path and it rains, the rain is going to fill in the path. It's that simple. We can see that every day. So the hypothesis is, what if the Earth did experience these discharges, which had a profound effect on the topology of the Earth? But now we're in, under the influence of a quiescent state of rain, snow, erosion. Could these um, processes that had already sculpted the Earth influence what we see in the rivers today? Now, we do know that fluvial erosion happens. We can measure it. We've seen it in the Earth. These are pictures from Alaska where you see the snowfall actually freezing and then melting and carving river channels. And then you have what's called alluvial fans towards the bottom. As the water decreases its energy um, and dissipates its energy, it spreads out. So this can be measured. But there are other places where it does not happen so clearly, especially on Mars when you look at craters. Um, the last electric conference, we had a wonderful tour of the Mars geology. And the big discrepancy here is that these alluvial fans actually go downhill. So it's the wrong direction. This is the problem. This is the, this is the edge of the Victoria Crater. So we would expect these alluvial fans to actually increase as your fluids run down to the bottom of the crater, but that does not happen. There must be another mechanism in place because uh, it does not account for fluvial um, creation of these dendritic patterns. Fluvial patterns, we know happen. Again, Google Earth, thank you. So you can increase your magnification. This is Canyon Lake down in Texas. They had a, a river dam uh, breach, or not a river, a lake breach. And you can see what happened to the limestone, the surrounding limestone region. You can then pixelate that and visualize that and do some measurements on it. Fairly linear, goes straight downhill to the river where it feeds into the river. We know it's a fluvial pattern. In the same way, you can do that on a great Mississippi. Or I'm sorry, this is Mount St. Helens. We'll get to the Mississippi in another slide. The Mount St. Helens, the eruption happened. The pyroclastic flow flowed down to the, near, uh, the lowest region. You can also quantify that, pixelate it, and look at the flow of where it, where it occurred. It also had some side channels here that I forgot to put in. Now we get on to fluvial patterns. Right? This is Lake Armistad down in uh, Texas. 
This has been dammed. So this has restricted the flow of the river over the course of time. And what we see in stark contrast to an existing river flow is a dendritic pattern occurring. Why does this occur? Because you're changing the base level. The base level is an important fundamental aspect of geology that says, well, water's going to flow to the lowest level. And if there's an erosive layer there, it's going to eventually erode it away and create a new base level. If there's a, a level there that cannot be eroded away, that will be your base level. So my question is, if this is an existing base level and this is a river, how did these existing dendritic patterns form? If you increase your base level, it's going to fill into what was already there. But those should have already flowed from somewhere else into the base level of the river. So it's kind of like a cat chasing its tail now, and we're trying to figure out how to deconfound these factors. In the same way, you can look at the Mississippi floodplain. Uh, this is a part of the Mississippi River here in terrain mode. And you see extensive arrays of dendritic channels, especially in the Ozark region. Rolling channels. If you ever rent, drove, driven through Missouri, it's just constant, constant up and down. The problem here is if these were all fluvial as a result of um, flooding, they would also have the similar drainage pattern to a base level, but they do not. In the same way, if this had a base level, we would see the same dendritic patterns brought about by constant flooding of the Mississippi in the near, pa in the near past. We don't see that. These dendritic patterns further do not drain to anywhere. They are there on their own. So this begs the question, what brought, brought about these dendritic patterns, and how can we measure them in the differences between them in the fluvial patterns? As I mentioned, this concept of base level, in reading through some of the basic textbooks on geology written by Tarbuck, say, if you take an introductory geology course, over and over he says, running water is the single most important agent sculpting the Earth's land surface. That is a constant uh, mantra of current geology. And that's to be said because they have come up with hypothesis as to how this water erodes, and some models that are val validated by experimental research. The major factors include your slope, your bed, your suspended loads, the types of materials, your depth, your width, your physical barriers, and your rainfall. These can all be measured and modeled. This is introducing the concept of design of experiments. You have factors which you can control or at least monitor. And then you have your responses, including your sedimentation, what's being brought down this slope by rainfall or some sort of flood that gets deposited on this new bedrock layer. The river flow, the flow rate, the erosion rate, how fast this sedimentary layer is deposited in the new area. So all these factors can be measured, and you can come up with models. Uh, this in particular is from the Department of Agriculture, a general technical report that people can use to measure stream characteristics. And because of these extensive stream characteristics, and also rivers, this applies to rivers as well, but it's not as many um, classifications because it's pretty difficult to classify larger systems. But, uh, but you can see that the larger slopes lead to straighter channels. It's a very fundamental sense. Lower slopes lead to what's called meandering and stream capture. So these guys can capture over here, and then you can form other um, circular regions. And that happens all the time along the floodplains and also deltas, where the river runs out to its current oceans and base levels. So we have these pictures, and we also can study what kind of erosion rates happen with different types of, of, of gravel or base material. But again, it all goes back to a certain base level. It all has to eventually flow to the lowest point where it can uh, get to. So right now, 47 plus streams. Uh, I think the, the classification of rivers is around 30. What does that do for us for electrical discharges? So now on to discharges simplified in one slide. So the charge build up here, if we have two plates powered by an electrical source, we have an electric field that builds up across a dielectric, the blue being a dielectric whether it be solid, liquid, gas. Eventually, it's going to discharge if you get enough charge built up. That's why capacitors eventually break. The charge equilibrates by discharging across the path. The factors, again, we go back to the design of experiments and monitoring what we know in the system. Many things can influence how this discharges. Your electrode materials, the type of dielectric, 
the potential of electricity there, the surface topology of these two electrodes, surface morphology, et cetera, et cetera. Small points will increase the local electric field there. Now the response is what do you get out when this occurs, much like a lightning bolt, you get magnetic fields around the current flow. You get a full spectrum of light, anywhere from x-rays to visible light. You get heat manifested in heating up the local surroundings and possible nuclear interactions if it's strong enough and you have pinch effects. It's a very, very simplified version of discharges, but it enables us to measure things in the laboratory so we can monitor our factors, we can measure our responses and build models from them. And because electricity is scalable, we can assume that things scale up. Now a lot of work has been done on, on fractal analysis of dielectric uh, discharges because this is very important for the wire and cable industry, for those who make transformers and power supplies. Okay, so early on you can see as early as 1990, 1984, people have been doing work on the fractal dimensions of dielectric discharges. And, and fundamentally what they found is that they all possess a certain fractal dimension that's characteristic of the material. So some of these include, uh, um, this is a, actually an internet picture of a dis discharge across a transformer onto the insulator. But these are from the papers that, that I studied. Uh, this is from Kudo's paper, where he measured them, and he then measured the, dial um, the uh, fractal properties of those items. Typically, they were performed in high voltage discharges across solid uh, plastics or gaseous medium. So now it's quiz time. Some of you have seen this already, so don't cheat. So I can tell you, there, there are three pictures here that I've pixelated and turned into a binary picture. To illustrate the scalability of electricity, assuming that the Grand Canyon was formed by an electric discharge, probably not the only thing it was formed by, but let's just for the moment assume a certain part of it is. Try to match each letter with the particular picture. I'll give you a minute here. So we have orders of magnitude scale here, centimeters from a polycarbonate discharge to meters of a discharge on cement, and then kilometers for the canyon. So everyone got their choices? All right. Oh, I heard some awes. How many people got, be proud of yourselves, how many people got it right? Just for curiosity. All right. Okay. It's, it's not that easy when things are pixelated and you normalize everything. So what you're doing is you're normalizing all of your uh, particular um, topography to only that which you can see in terms of what was formed by the discharge. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. So you can see here that scalability is, is an effect. So I thought about how rivers are formed, um, how discharges could affect the surface of the earth, and I, I kind of dug it down to the main effects here. So what this is called is a cause, of di this is a cause and effect Ishikawa diagram, they call it. We use this a lot to identify problems in uh, industry or, or whatever we're working with. So on, on the left here is riverbeds. How were they formed? Well, the hypothesis, we know they're formed somewhat by fluvial events, but they could also be formed by electrical discharges. Ignore this for the moment. Technically, you're not supposed to have characterization tools in with this diagram, but I wanted to share this to uh, run parallel with these. So the fluvial factors, again, the factors that influence the fluvial erosion of rivers include the following. You could have age consistency, sufficient rainfall, et cetera. You can read through these. High slopes, low slopes, tectonics, dissolved load, your suspended load, all these factors. And then what I did is I kind of assigned categories, colored categories, to those that are measurable and testable by what we can do in the lab or in the field. Also red, which is not testable. It fails the requirements to be a scientific study. You cannot repeatably measure it. And also historical accounts, because there are a lot of historical accounts of certain electrical plasma discharge phenomena, which we now know. So in terms of the rivers, I don't know if this color is going to show up enough, but, um, but really what I saw, and you know what, we can talk about this afterwards if you disagree, but um, really tectonics and pre-existing geology are the assumptions. They're not testable. But nearly everything for fluvial existing uh, rivers can be measured, but you can't measure that which has happened in the past. So that automatically eliminates some aspects of this. For electrical discharge, we had a few different items here, um, either a large solar outburst or close earth encounters with various items, 
You could probably come up with some other factors here, right? But for the most part, we now know that there is evidence of current in space, right? We, we've talked about that a few times. Um, even in the popular press, I shouldn't say popular, but academic press, there is measurement of electric current in scale jets for coming from ga galaxies. So it does occur in space. We can now use that as part of our toolbox to say electric current is scalable. We know it happens at the galactic scale. For one component of this jet, we obtained for the first time a determination of galactic scale electric current and its direction. And this is an astrophysics physics journal. Okay? So that's encouraging. So from factor, um, we know that compositional changes can affect how electric discharge occurs. So you can see that all these things add in to electrical discharge, making it somewhat uh, of a feasible phenomenon. We have some historical sources from the ancients and interplanetary distances being less than they were in the present. That could be debated, but, but I do believe we have some historical accounts of that. But anything that's inferred without any drawing on any references, it's inferred. Breakdown of the atmosphere, um, Thomas Gold and some others have said that you need a flux of about greater than 20 gauss to have that discharge occur across the Earth. So it could have happened in the past. Now for characterization, the only things we're missing here, um, anything that in terms of that draws on the past, geologic timescales and non-measured or kind of present is key to the past. Because we don't know if that riverbed was flowing as fast as it is now, especially if we can't find the sediment load that it left over. That's an important aspect. So that's one way we can break down the problem um, and try to visualize it as to what factors are most important. I mentioned measurement methods here. So now we're going to get into uh, what I looked at. A fractal is a self-similar pattern. In other words, it's the same as, a near, as they are near as they are from far. Very few things are perfectly self-similar in nature. That means if you increase your magnification all the way, they look the same as you back out. Most of the time, they're, um, they're known as self-affine. In other words, they're scaled by different amounts in certain directions. That's more the, more the case with riverbeds. But certain, as, certain of them can be, uh, are known to be self-similar, and there's some separate tests you can do that that I have not done yet. Now, what's interesting in all the research with riverbeds is that it's really only confined river networks that exhibit self-affinity, as well as some self-similarity. Regular flowing networks of rivers, such as the Mississippi um, and other uh, large river networks, um, do not exhibit that. So already we're looking at the landform confounding our analysis of this. So the landform is dictating how the river flows. So could we test the dissimilarity between these measured fractal dimensions of electric discharges on what we know in the lab with landforms that we know on the Earth? So taking you back to the, uh, to the picture, think about the picture. You can think about any picture here that has a hole and then rain or some sort of flow rate moving in. It's going to be captured. So measuring the fractal analysis of the Earth. Uh, as I mentioned, Mandelbrot did uh, a little bit of this in his book. Uh, it's a great book, a, um, I think a, a trendsetter there. Uh, he did a lot of analysis of the coasts, and now people are taking that into three dimensions and measuring some aspects of geomorphology. Um, most recently, I came across a paper that I think is very powerful in that it studied isolines at varying altitudes. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a moment. So basically, they're taking fractal dimensions at varying altitudes on the whole Earth's surface because they have uh, data for that. I'll read you a little bit of this. The quantitative analysis of natural relief represents an objective form of aiding in the visual interpretation of landscapes. As studies on coastlines, river networks, and global topography have shown, still an open question is whether a clear relationship between the quantitative properties of landscapes and the dominant geomorphologic processes, rain, wind, water, that originate them can be established. In this contribution, we show that the geometry of topographic isolines is an appropriate, appropriate observable to help disentangle such a relationship. I haven't totally disentangled it, but they're getting there. Really, in the conclusions, though, as I, I found, it's kind of surprising. A more detailed inspection points to a relationship between the observed features and the geological processes that shape the planetary surface. We suggest that the erosive action of a solid or viscous phase the erosion of a flowing liquid phase or its action through wave breaking and tectonics are geological agents which work towards increasing roughness, increasing roughness in the landscape. On the other hand, agents causing sediment deposition, formation, and pronounced smooth slopes or erosion through hydrostatic pressure, glacials, 
caused by large masses of liquid or ice, represents some smoothing agents, is able to decrease the characteristic fractal dimension. The rougher you are, the higher the fractal dimension. The smoother you are, the lower the fractal dimension. The problem I have with this is that they're referring to water doing the same thing. That's how I interpret that. So typically what they get on a map, um, function of fractal dimension D, as you can see that 1.8 from 1, and you can see that mountains obviously are uh, the, the highest fractal dimension. Okay. Drawn by the coastlines, which are fairly smooth due to wave action and sediments on the layer. And then your intercontinental, um, I guess, sea floors and your trenches, they also were able to resolve. So I'll go and draw some conclusions from this with the next graph. But really, a study of ice lines, so what, basically what they're doing is they're measuring um, a box counting relationship. So the measurement of your fractal dimension D is a relationship, a logarithmic relationship with the number of boxes that they can fill into a certain area that's scaled, and the scaling factor being eta. So on this map of New Jersey, okay, another beautiful region, the Congleton Preserve, you can fill in an area at 1,000 meters, say in height. And you can fill in that isoline with a certain number of boxes, count them. You then do the same thing with a larger, box, larger area or the different isoline. A larger area, you'll have a different number of boxes you can then get a plot. So this is from Baldessari's paper, which I just showed you. And you can see that at different uh, elevations, you have an increasing D level as you increase your elevation up to about 4,500 meters. That D level is that slope of this line. And interestingly, below the sea and right at sea level, you have very low fractal dimensions brought about by fluvial erosion. So again, the, fl the, the, the fractal dimension increases with your increasing height and elevation. I think that says something about the mechanism of how these mountains were formed. So what did I do? In my spare time, I took ImageJ, which is a microscopy analysis software. A little bit wordy of a chart here, I apologize. but. I took the fractal dimension by the box counting method, typically between one and two. The areas of each image was between 500 and 1,000 miles squared. I was able to get a resolution of about one pixel per 125th of a mile. So you may say, okay, well, these are three-dimensional figures. How can you project them in 2D? In some of the electrical studies, they said that, hey, this is valid as long as this projection on a 2D plane has D values of 1.7. So the color-coded data sets are from fluvial, which are blue, known electrical events from the laboratory and from literature papers, and then unknown structures from terrain mode captures. The image processing you can accomplish fairly readily. Uh, requires a little bit of footwork to get rid of some of the uh, roads and whatnot on Google Earth. But you, you, binary, you grayscale it, then you binary it, and you get this binary pattern which you can then do your analysis on. But furthermore, I skeletonized it because I knew we were dealing with different elevations. So the pattern that this follows, right, can be of elevation of about 600 meters from the center of this channel up to the side. So a way to kind of normalize um, your overall patterning and distribute it to only the branched pattern is to skeletonize that. And so you can do that with your software. So eventually what you're getting is only a skeletonized pixelated version of only the pattern. And then you can measure your, your, your box counting, through your box counting method, your fractal dimension. So here's a picture of Mississippi that I was talking about. Um, numerous floodplains here. You can pixelate it, binary it, and you get a D value of 1.3. This is up in Newfoundland. Uh, you're getting a value of about 1.7, even just with the standard uh, binary image. A lightning bolt, again, we're projecting this onto a 2D, which is valid. You're getting about 1.3. And again, this is limited resolution. This is far away. You can't get all the little dendrites that are coming off this. So that's one aspect that I think the electrical uh, analysis is missing, in that we can't resolve all those fine dendrites, except with some of the laboratory tests that I took. So a little bit of statistics here. So if you all remember your student's t-test, 95% confidence interval, I'm confident that this is different than that. Uh, what this is doing is because I have different uh, values of population sets, it's a different kind of student's t-test. So when I did that with just the straight pixelated version, 
um, nothing was different. And with the skeletonized version, some differences did appear. Uh, namely, when you skeletonize the landforms, you don't have that drastic of a drop in D value as opposed from your river values. And indeed, you get a very big significant difference with that skeletonized value because you're normalizing all the elevation. And indeed, what happens here is your fluvial value decreases to about the same value that Baldessari found in all the fluvial erosion studies between 1 and 1.2. Your unknown structures that I measured on the Earth are equivalent to electrical structures. So statistically speaking, the unknowns are more statistically dissimilar to fluvial events than they are from electrical events in the laboratory. So really what that skeletonized value is doing is it's normalizing the depth. Okay? And we can say that these structures are self-defined, self these, these D values. They're fairly high enough to be self-defined. So really, in conclusion, the present data set, limited right now, only 33 counts I think I had. I'm working on getting more. Is, uh, I think electrical patterns are better matched towards our, our landforms and the fluvial patterns. But we have to realize that other data includes uh, fluvial erosion, because rivers have been flowing for some time. So we have to account for that. We have to know the systems that we're measuring very well to account for the fact that some fluvial erosion may have occurred. So it's consistent with the literature trends. There's a lot to do. There always is. But really, what, do, what effects do such discharges have on, on the environment, right? I'm interested in shock-induced changes. That's something I do all the time. What, is, what does that do to rock? And what does that do to um, populations of organisms around that if it did occur? Could that account for many mysterious losses of uh, populations of ancient cultures? What does that do to temperature and also radioactive decay? That was already mentioned earlier. Some profound implications on geological sciences here that we have to explore more. So again, hopefully the further augment that data set um, with more analysis and we'll have a better picture of what's going on. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, Michael and Montgomery also for their discussions. Got a copyright Google or so we won't get sued. And if anyone wants to contact me, there's my contact information. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks.